We're back for more. Uh, we've covered a wide variety of topics. Um, just finished up phosphorus, gonna dive right into potassium here. So this is again a trial that we're looking at, blue bar being untreated, the orange bar being Meltdown 401. This is looking at soil availability. This is not tissues. This is soil availability, simply looking at the available amount of the specific nutrient. In this case, we're looking at potassium. So 2019, thing just like phosphorus to note, rainfall was five to eight inches above the 10 year average. In 2020, 14 inches below the 10 year average. As we move over to 2019, you can see the advantage. Um, you know, we look at month four and you know, you're about 275 pounds of, of potassium uh, in the Meltdown 401 combo and you're about 180. So 95 pounds um, mm -hmm. at, you know, what would be about R3. Move over to 2020 and, um, you know, again, this is in one of their worst droughts that they've had. They ended up being 17.3 inches behind their 10 year average. You look at month one, look at month two, look at month three. And the thing that is fascinating here is in 2019, when mother nature is working with you, right? You got constant moisture that's making potassium available. We know how important moisture is to potassium availability, don't we, Sean? That's right. Um, it's still amazing to me to see the, the fact that where we combine Meltdown and 401, we're bringing more potassium availability than the untreated in what many would call a, a perfect year of potassium availability. Shift over to 2020, and that spread just significantly widens. This is really what has probably put us on alert, I would say, as a company the last um, really, I don't know, 45 days, mm -hmm. maybe 60 days, as far as trying to dig in and get some answers behind us. Why are we seeing this? And again, so 2019 would have been the start of this. 2020 would have been year two. 2021 would be year three of the data. So what you're looking at and thing to note is, is that year one, the blue bar is the grower standard, right? Well, year two is still the grower standard of two years, but on the 2020 data, that's two years of meltdown and 401 being combined. The reason I bring that up is, is there's a lot of people that have asked the question, well, if I use your biologicals one time, right, I'm not gonna see a response from it the second year, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm not gonna see a response the third year. I only gotta use it one time. And, you know, really, before this data and before some of the data that our that our growers are sharing that have been on the system for six years, you know, you kind of just sound like a sales guy, right? Like, well, no, no, not at all. You got to keep using them every year. <laughs> but what we have seen is, is that there's actually a, a significant, um, I don't know, stair step, I guess, for there lack is. of a better word, yeah. is it, it seems that things only get better. Um, you know, we had a we had a dealer meeting that we had 37 dealers from Indiana, North Central Indiana, Ohio, and a couple out of Michigan. And it was interesting that one of the dealers came up to me at the meeting and he says, you know, this is my third year of, of using Meltdown and 401. And he says, when I walk across my fields, they feel different. Sure. They they just feel different. And and that is something that that does get um, that does get talked about. Um, we might have some ideas on why that might be, um, but I think it's it's fascinating to see that through the use of beneficial microbes and really pairing meltdown as the foundation, 401 on top of that, that we see nutrient solubilization only get better with time. Yeah, I really feel like we're changing the soil as we as we use these products, uh, you know, year after year, uh, especially where we have trials that we've done this ending over and over. And I think that last slide that you showed is impressive with at 2020 being as dry as it was. When you think about potassium, and so, so we kind of go back to what we've talked about previously, like on a soil test, and potassium is known to get locked between clay layers, and so as that, as that ground shrinks, you know, if, if, this is, if the potassium's in the middle and we go into a drought year like they had in 2020, it, it gets locked in there like this. And so for that to happen and you still see that significant, that much of a significant difference in the amount of K that's available as compared to the untreated, uh, it's really impressive what these biology are doing, what, or what they sure appear to be doing, to making K more available. And so this is the, the the third year of that trial. This is the 21. So we just showed you 19 and 20. We've showed it for phosphorus. This is what it is for pot potassium, and it follows the same suit where we see uh, the untreated is yellow bar, blue is 401 by itself, 
Orange is meltdown by itself, and the gray is the combination of the two. What we see here is especially when it comes to K, that I think on the previous one uh, with phosphorus, we really saw some huge advantages of meltdown. Uh, we saw big advantages of 401 compared to the untreated, but meltdown was just really, really lights out there. Well, here what we see is we see that combination of the two products making more K available, and it's significant all the way out through R3, uh, where we're trying to finish that crop out. And you think about that, you know, what is, what is K a big constant? It constitutes a lot of our stock and standability and those types of things. And, and you know, you see a year where, especially a year like 21, you know, in, in some parts where guys had some really, really good crop, we utilized everything that that plant had to give. If we've got that much available K, then we really have a potential to improve our standability and do some of those things with it as well. We obviously know that we broke down what a diazotroph is, what ammonifying bacteria is, what phosphate solubilizers are, you know, those that release hormones, those that release ACC, deaminase, a precursor to ethylene. We've, we've, we've seen all of those things. And now we just unpacked a whole lot of data talking about potassium, but we really haven't talked a whole lot about potassium from a microbial side of things. And, mm -hmm. And, and we're gonna go to, we're gonna go to a research paper. Um, and, and I would challenge you to, to look this up for yourself. Um, but potassium is one of the major macronutrients which play an important role in plant growth and development. Things that I think that we both agree with that most everybody would agree with. Total soil potassium re reserves are generally large. However, a large portion of it exists in insoluble K minerals. So insoluble means that it's not plant available and very little potassium becomes available to plant. There are certain microorganisms which use a number of biological processes to make potassium available from unavailable forms. Is that saying what I think it's saying? I think it's saying that biology makes K available. These potassium solubilizing bacteria, known as KSBs, can be used as a promising approach to increase potassium availability in soils, thus playing an important role for crop establishment under K-limited soils. Owing to natural available source of potassium in soil and high price of synthetic potassium fertilizers, which you growers know all about that, the importance of KSB is increasing day by day. The use of chemical fertilizers can be decreased by using KSB in agriculture that can lead to sustainable agriculture. Now I gotta stop for a second because sustainable agriculture is a word that I've heard probably a thousand times. It's probably not going away, is it, Sean? No, that's, that's something that's, uh, it's a buzzword today. Sustainable. A number of workers have demonstrated the role of KSB, or potassium solubilizing bacteria, in crop improvement. The present review highlights the importance of KSB for enhancing crop production. The mechanisms used by KSB for K solubilization have been discussed. The work of various scientists regarding plant growth promotion through KSB is reviewed in detail and has also been discussed. What I think is fascinating here is that there's research papers to prove out that Maybe biology is extremely important. When we think about you unpacking that soil sample and we think about making recommendations for our soils of $200 or $300 per acre off of just the chemical component, what have we been missing for all of these years? We don't talk about biology. And the question that I have to ask, like this is a legit question that I, I have to ask is, which industry really is snake oil now? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, I think for years, because the biological sector has been, I don't, a misnomer, has been maybe unknown, hasn't had a, a lot of people diving into it, that it's easy to throw sticks at it, right? Well, let's unpack that a little bit, right? So we went, we went to the whiteboard and we talked about uh, recommendations for spreading, you know, hundreds and five and six hundred pounds of potash. I, I believe that the, the dinner table drawing that we put up there kind of disproves the, 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 any ability of that to work. You make a valid point. And also, didn't the University of Illinois do a potassium paradox study that they published? Oh that boy, was you're gonna get darts now, Bodie Kitchell. 20 but, some uh, years, 20 some years of, of corn with no potassium applied and they saw that potassium levels actually increased up. in the soil. Yeah. The only reason that I share this is, is to challenge you to maybe think differently than the way that you've thought for years. You know, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome, right? That's right. And one thing, one saying that I really like to say is, is that, you know, we can't do what we've always done because we're going to get what we've always got. 
That's right. And if we think about, you know, you referenced the whiteboard, right? We think about the dollars that are at stake today from what 185 pounds of MAP costs, what 310 pounds of potash costs. And you think of what the alternative is, using a Meltdown 401 and looking at the cost of that. Economics are going to play a huge role in this. If it's not economics that are the most important to you, regulations probably are coming right behind them. Sure. And that looks to be what's happening. And you've said this, and you said it in another video, economics, logistics. And agronomics. And agronomics. And, and, and you know, we don't, economics have to be important. We can't just, but that can't be the only thing. No. Nope. We can't just say, okay, well, I can't afford to do this, and I throw it out, and I don't use anything. We're, we're showing that we can, we can use less, but we can't just walk away from the fertilizer if we're not doing some other things to try to make the biological side better. So it's, it's interesting because as I unpack this, right, um, I think it makes sense why we talk about 365 so much, mm -hmm. right? Um, why we talk about the importance to us in our roles to be able to have the conversations with growers across the entire U.S. working in wheat in Kansas and Oklahoma with guys we get to work with, you know, potatoes in Idaho, right? Those soils are indifferent. Those environments are different. But when we have soils and tissues and we're taking treated and untreated, we're understanding how our microbes are working across a lot of different soils, a lot of different environments. And it's pretty cool to read research papers like this that support the things that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And to know that we've got a research team, a scientific team down in Florida that is continually working to develop and find and isolate the new microbes. Some could argue that Biodyne's been very successful for what they've done for the last nine years. Mm -hmm. So why make any changes? Right. Why add new strains of microbes in? Why change anything that you've done? Why, why go searching for other things that you, your microbes might be, might be doing? And, and I think that, that that, in a nutshell, is really who we are, is we want, to, we want to know everything that we can possibly know about our microbes so that we can have a conversation with you and really focus and hone in on the efficiency side of your operation. Well, success, you know, what's success? If, you're, if, you, if, you, if you have a seed corn hybrid at a trial, what do you expect? What's the success rate to make you successful? 60%? 65%? Uh, beauty's the eye of the beholder. Right. I mean, and so, so what, we, what we try to do with 365 and what the guys at the lab are doing is, is, is nothing works all the time, but we're trying to understand and pinpoint the things where we weren't successful so that we could be successful in those areas and understand, you know, what the limitation was. That's what it's about. We're not here to just, here's some biology, tell us what the yield is at the end of the year. We are here to walk through this throughout the season uh, and in the off season and we want to put our products in the best chance of success. Couldn't say it better.